All right. So, so, so picking up where we left off last time, if, if you'd like to follow along, the, the slides are online and I've created a bit.ly link so you don't have to type out a couple pages of random let characters. Um, and and uh, this will actually be useful for the uh, tutorial that I'm doing later today. Uh, everything is on, on GitHub. And so there's a Mathematica notebook that we'll play around with uh, in the tutorial. Um, in any case, so, so last time I sort of gave you the, the broad overview and the, the talk was very much a colloquium style talk where I just sort of talked about big ideas and over lunch there were some conversations about um, I'm not really sure what you're trying to do here and I, fair enough because we didn't really actually uh, do that much. But the goal today is to really sort of start to delve into more of the technical details and, and see how some of this comes about. So, so today we're going to talk about computational differential geometry. So last time we, we drew pictures of model manifolds um, and today we're going to learn how to actually explore them numerically. What's that? I can move it up a little higher. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, and so, so after, after doing that, we're going to take a little detour and talk about several different ways that information geometry has had some influence on uh, the field of numerical optimization. And then, uh, then we'll come back to the problem of sloppy models and modeling, and we'll talk about the manifold boundary approximation method, which we call MBAM, and that's uh, a technique for systematically removing the sloppy model or the sloppy parameters from a complicated model. So that's the agenda for today. Okay, so computational differential geometry. I've kind of been polling people over the last day or so of how much different differential geometry they've had. And the responses have varied quite a bit. So there's somebody who took differential geometry last semester and is an expert, and other people are feeling a little shaky on it. When I originally put these slides together a couple weeks ago, um, I was thinking probably everyone has seen it at some point or another. And I just threw a couple, a couple slides together with a bunch of random uh, differential geometry facts, uh, mostly just to sort of get the juices flowing and get us in the right frame of mind, but they really aren't put together in any sort of coherent way. Uh, and so I think I'm going to abandon those and mostly work at the chalkboard. And so hopefully it will be interactive and you can tell me where you're, where you're confused and where, what we need to explain. Um, but the idea is we're going to study differential manifolds. Uh, differential manifold is a collection of points uh, connected uh, in a smooth way, such that the neighborhood of each point looks like uh, Cartesian M space, where M is the dimensionality of the manifold. And usually when we say manifold, we really mean differentiable manifold. Uh, we just don't want to say differentiable over and over again. So that's what I, when I say manifold, I mean differentiable manifold. Uh, so, so differentiable manifold is made up of points. What is a point? Well, it's basically any type of object you want. So in our case, the points are going to be probability distributions that are distinguishable by their predictions. And this is really, uh, this point here is I think what makes differential geometry such a beautiful subject, is that uh, you can study uh, the, the properties of lots of different things because point is just a stand-in for any type of object that you want. Okay, so <clears throat> with that, Thinking back to yesterday, we're going to have some sort of parameter space. Let's say theta 1, theta 2. And so these, these parameters are going to act as coordinates on our model. So we're going to have some mapping. And this mapping is, is, in fact, our model. Let's go ahead and just say It's our sum of two exponentials that we are now very comfortable with, hopefully, a little bit, <laughs> and, uh, and use that. So, so we're going to choose a point in parameter space that defines theta 1 and theta 2. 
that allow us to evaluate our model and give precise, precise predictions for a few time points. Let's go ahead and say I have three predictions that my model is going to make. And now you've all seen the picture, so you know that this looks something like, like this. Uh, in the tutorial, we'll play around with how choosing the time points sort of affects the shape. Um, but the idea is that uh, you choose a point in your parameter space, you apply it to your model, and you land somewhere over here. And if you imagine some curve through this parameter space, the model will also map this to some curve over here. <clears throat> and so over here, you can start talking about tangent vectors to this line. Let's focus on the ones right here. And I'm going to call this vector, I'm going to denote it by V alpha. And this direction is going to correspond to some direction over here tangent to the model manifold that I'm going to denote by V vector. And the relationship between these two things uh, is just the, uh, the chain rule for, uh, for your model. So this is dy d theta. This is just the Jacobian, so this is J alpha, if you like. Okay. Now there are special vectors uh, over, over here that correspond to the coordinate axes of our parameter space. So let's switch colors here. So imagine a curve where, in which this blue line is now the tangent vector, or another curve where the orange line is the tangent vector. Those will both map to some pair of vectors over here. And I guess to make it consistent, this one should really be something more like that. And these, these vectors are just the columns of J. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, these two vectors span what we call the tangent space. So the space, the vector space spanned by these, these vectors lives at this point on the model manifold, and it's uh, this, is, this is very hard to draw. Think of a curved surface. It's the plane that sits, sits tangent right there. And so at each point on the model manifold, we attach a tangent space. That's the vector space spanned by these, these uh, basis vectors. And so you have this tangent space that's sort of moving around as you go through the model manifold. <clears throat> Okay, now, if we continue on our curve here, we can ask, I should choose a different color here, let's do green. Actually, that might look too much like the back of the, the chalkboard, let's do yellow. So right here, there's another vector that's tangent to our curve. And so, this point, will now live on this line a little bit further down. It also has some other tangent vector. Now, I should put a, a vector arrow on this. Now, our goal here is to do some vector calculus on these things. Uh, we're, we're working towards concept of a geodesic, ultimately. Uh, so, so we want to be able to compare the vector here with the vector here. And the problem with that is that they live in different spaces. Uh, the tangent space here is different from the tangent space here. 
And so we need some way of, of connecting them. And, and there's an important object in differential geometry called the connection. And so I'm going to give an ad hoc motivation for, for how to think of that. Uh, let's see. Can I put this screen up? And if I click uh, power off, there we go. Okay, let's see if that works. So you should think of this curve here through the parameter space that I denote with by V alpha as being parameterized by some, some parameterization that I'm going to call S. And that means this curve that goes through the model manifold is also parameterized by S. And we want to look at how this thing is changing. Well, that is okay. We can use Leibniz rule. We can see if we want to, to find out how the vector's changing, we need to look at more than just how the components are changing. We need to also account for how our basis vectors are changing. <clears throat> okay. I can rewrite this. Let's see, how do I want to, to, to motivate this? So uh, our basis vectors can be rotating on the model manifold in a couple different ways. Uh, part of their rotation is caused by the fact that this manifold has curvature. So the tangent plane here is different from the tangent plane here, and so our basis vectors have had to rotate. And they've rotated in a way that's out of the tangent plane. But they've also, they, they can also sort of rotate into one another. Right? And so this part will have two components. One that's due to the curvature, specifically the extrinsic curvature, and one that's due to how the basis vectors are rotating around. Okay. Uh, so Bates and Watts referred to that last part as parameter effects curvature, and they referred to the other as intrinsic curvature. And that's actually a misnomer. It should be extrinsic curvature. So we're going to break this up. So we have... I'm going to call this parallel um, V alpha Y perpendicular. So this piece is due to the curvature. Extrinsic curvature. This piece is parameter effects curvature. In the end, I'm not going to be so much interested in this piece. But this piece let's see. Uh, what's that? Is it the alpha y? Ah, yeah. 
There we go. Okay. So the parameter effects curvature, since it's the part that's parallel to the existing tangent vectors, I can expand that as something that is proportional to the existing tangent vectors. So whatever that something is, well, it's going to have to have an alpha index and a beta index. Uh, del alpha y where? Oh, yes, thank you. Yep. Very good. I dropped it at some point, didn't I? Thank you. Okay, so far so good. So this suggests that I can write, I'm going to do one more piece of chalkboard magic, I guess. Alpha and beta are being summed over. So those are dummy indices. So I'm going to swap them. I'm going to call that beta and that alpha. Okay, and now I can factor out d alpha y from this whole thing. Okay, so. If we want to look at the derivative of our vector, and we're sort of wanting to do all of our calculations over here in parameter space, if we want to take the derivative of V alpha, we don't just blindly take the derivative with respect to its parameterization. We have to also account for how the basis vectors are rotating. Now, this particular derivation relied on the fact that I'm going through an arb uh, a special curve here that I've defined. So in general, what we do, we define what's called the covariant derivative. And all I've done here is replace the, the S, the derivative with respect to S with respect to an arbitrary direction. And that just gives me another, another index on all of these derivatives. There's a little bit of hand waving going on here, but roughly speaking, this term, this, these gamma terms, they, these are called the Christoffel symbols or the connection coefficients. And they're exactly the information we need to be able to do calculus here that tell us how the tangent planes are related at different points. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'm going to ask a question. Suppose I have some vector field that satisfies this. What does that mean? 
Yeah. So this, this is what we call the condition for parallel transport. This is saying there's some vector v that when I move in the alpha direction, it's not rotating. Well, not quite. It could be rotating inside of the embedding space because of the curvature, but it's not rotating parallel to the plane at all. So this is parallel transport. So what we're going to be interested in are curves that go in as straight as line as possible on the model manifold without leaving the model manifold. There's going to be some r movement in the, the embedding space because the manifold is curved, but we don't want it to curve in the tangent plane. So if you can imagine yourself living on a, some model manifold with some curvature, imagine you're riding a motorcycle on it. We want to find the curve that you would trace out if you were to drive your motor motorcycle on the model manifold and never turn the handlebars. If you're on a Taurus, you might loop around and do all sorts of crazy things, but that's all because of the curvature, not because of how it's been coordinatized. And so a geodesic is a path that parallel transports its own tangent vectors. Let's say u alpha of s is the tangent vector. It will satisfy this equation, u alpha nabla alpha u beta equals zero. So to find a geodesic, this is the equation we want to solve. Oh, there's one last thing that I, I forgot to mention. I haven't told you what the connection coefficients are. Uh, in general, uh, the connection coefficients have to satisfy a particular transformation rule. So they're, they're famously not a tensor because they don't transform like a tensor. Uh, but other than that, there's some flexibility in how you define them. Uh, so for different, uh, so, so you can take a model manifold that has a particular metric and you can associate different connections with it to get different curvatures on your, on your model manifold. Uh, but there's a beautiful theorem, it's called the Fundamental Theorem of Riemannian Geometry that says there's actually a unique connection that preserves the metric under parallel transport. And that's the metric connection. And rather than write it down, I'll pull the slides back up. Okay, so, so this is the derivation we, we just went through. Um, this is the transformation rule that the connection has to satisfy. Oops. And uh, we're going to be working in the, the metric connection. So, so the metric connection is a connection that's defined in terms of derivatives of the metric. So the metric we've already seen is derivatives of the model. So, so the connection is now going to involve second derivatives of the metric. Second derivatives of the model, I'm sorry. Okay, 
So this is what we just derived. This is the geodesic equation. Or in terms of the parameterized curve through parameter space, you get something that looks like this. So some, a few things to notice is that it's a second order differential equation. And I apologize, as I'm looking at it now, I see I'm using tau here to denote the parameterization through uh, parameter space. Yeah? Um, let's see. So there's a theorem that says there's a unique torsion-free tensor that preserves the metric under parallel transport, and it's this one. So. Uh, from an information theory point, so, so actually there, there is a family of connections that are known as the alpha connections that are a product of Amari, and they're, they're kind of interesting because they have some statistical significance. Uh, the, out, the zero, the alpha equals zero connection is equal to the metric connection. Uh, we're going to use this one mostly, partly for convenience and partly because of this theorem, but I think most of the results we'll look at will be independent of this choice. Certainly, certainly the, the geodesics that lead to MBAM in a few minutes won't matter which, which connection you use. Yep. Yes. Does that become the connection? Yes. So, yeah, so another way to think about it is the, these, these connections sort of come directly from the embedding space. So, so if you have an embedding space, there, there's a nice reason to use, use this. Okay, so this is a second order differential equation. If you've taken GR, this is sort of like a, a pseudo acceleration that comes from uh, curvature of space time. Uh, but it's nonlinear, uh, so there's two factors of the velocity here on the right, and furthermore, this, this expression for gamma can be a very complicated expression of, of your model. And so this is something we never write down an analytic expression for. Uh, we always uh, solve this numerically. Okay. So, so in general, actually calculating this thing is, is rather tedious. Uh, you have to take all these derivatives of, of your uh, of your metric, and you kind of have to go through that if you want to solve the geodesic equation because you have to have to write this down. Uh, it turns out there's a different expression for gamma that I prefer. Uh, if you have an expression for your model manifold in your embedding space, so we have a function y vector of theta, then the connection takes this nice form. So, so just a reminder, g with raised indices means the inverse metric. This is the Jacobian, and this is the uh, Hessian of your model predictions. So when you make that substitution, the geodesic equation becomes this. And the thing that I want to point out, that is sort of the saving grace of a lot of calculations we're about to do, is that this acceleration, this geodesic acceleration, involves this term with second derivatives, but the two derivatives are contracted with the velocity of your geodesic, the, the, the tangent vector in parameter space of your geodesic. Okay. And that's, that's going to make the, the calculation of this thing actually not, not too bad. Okay. There's not time. Okay. So a couple comments. When we first started doing this, we were looking at model manifolds and we were doing computational differential geometry. Um, uh, we sorting out what, what objects do we need to calculate. Well, we need to calculate derivatives. We need to be able to invert a metric. Uh, the metric is the Fisher information. We're looking at sloppy models. This is very ill-conditioned like we saw uh, last time. And so we need to calculate these derivatives as accurately as possible. And what that means is we never use finite differences because we lose half of our significant figures every time we do a finite difference. Uh, so we need to, uh, if we're solving a differential equation, we solve what are called the sensitivity equations. Uh, if we have an expression like the sum of exponentials, we actually just brute force uh, symbolically write down uh, the derivatives by hand and write a, another function for that. And that'll be what we do in the tutorial this afternoon. Um, and we'd like to do this for as large of models as we possibly can. And so we'd like to be able to do this in a way that's 
computationally fast. So I'm going to skip that. So the first approach we ended up adopting was a hybrid approach based in Python and C. Uh, and again, think, think about solving differential equations. That's what about three quarters of our models actually are. So what we, what we did was we came up with a sort of simple syntax that was easy to edit that could define a set of differential equations. This was as a Python script. And so basically, our Python script consisted of a list of strings that were the names of the parameters, a list of strings that were the names of the dynamical variables, and then a list of strings that define the right-hand side of our differential equation. And then we used this very nice Python package called SymPy that took all of these strings and converted them into symbolic objects, and it did a lot of calculus on this uh, so that we could calculate all the derivatives and analytic expressions for them. Uh, and in particular, we, we used, uh, rather than calculate the derivative along every single direction, uh, we calculated the directional derivative along an arbitrary direction. And then our script would uh, take these symbolic objects, convert them into C code, compile it, and, write, and construct a Python wrapper. Uh, and so in the end, everything was done in Python, but the, the slow stuff was done in this, in this C code. That worked really well for a while. Uh, the bottleneck to this approach ended up being compile time. That we started looking at models with, say, 50 dynamical variables, hundreds of parameters, and then this process of taking the script, which was a few hundred lines long, and simpying it and converting it into C code that ended up being tens of thousands of lines long, could take about an hour by the time it was all compiled, which wasn't a big deal at first because we would then use this code for weeks and weeks as we sort of used all sorts of differential geometry, geometry tools to study it. And so an hour overhead at the beginning wasn't a big deal. Uh, but a little later on, when we started doing model reduction, and that's what we're going to talk about at the end of today, uh, we ended up constructing lots of models and doing relatively few calculations on each. And in that case, this overhead uh, really killed us. And so we've, we've sw since switched to a different approach. Uh, and this is based in Julia. Uh, is everyone here, anyone here familiar with Julia? You're from MIT. You're, you should be familiar with Julia. Okay. So Julia is a, a relatively young programming language. Um, it's, it's a high-level scripting language that's designed for scientific computing. The basis is that it's, it's JIT compiled. So, so unlike Python that's interpreted, uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's JIT compiled and it's strongly typed, which means you can JIT compile actually very fast code. And most of the time, it, it, in a lot of cases, it can rival C or Fortran performance. Um, and, and Julia was motivated specifically with this need in mind that you have a lot of people using multiple languages. Can we write something that's high level, easy to write in, but still is fast, uh, so you don't need to have this need? And so, uh, so it worked well for us. The downside of using Julia is that it's, it's fairly young. It's currently on a version 0.5. And so some of the language core and library APIs are, subject, are kind of changing. Uh, but so far, we've been able to, to deal with that. Uh, so what we now do is we write one Julia function that defines our model. And then we use something called automatic differentiation. So uh, with a show of hands, who here knows what a dual number is? Oh, we've got to talk about dual numbers then. OK. Dual numbers are cool. Where's the white chalk? Here's one. So, so this is a, a computational paradigm where you construct a, um, in C you would, you would make a structure, it's, it's a user-defined type that has two, two components. Uh, it has a value and an epsilon value. And so you can think of this as the derivative of, of, the, value, of the thing that you, you've calculated. Uh, so so the, this is based on operator overloading. 
so that you can define, say, two dual numbers, let's say, U, so, so U bar is going to be our dual number, and it consists of a value U and an epsilon part that I'm going to call DU. Likewise with V, there's a value and an epsilon part. And then somewhere in your code, you have expressions that tell you to multiply two numbers. So the idea is that you'll write one piece of code, and if you're evaluating this and U and V are just normal everyday float 64 uh, real numbers, that it already knows how to do that. And now, what you're going to do is you're going to define how to multiply two dual numbers. And the answer is just the product rule. Right? And you do something similar for how to divide two numbers. Let's see, it's V U minus U DV. And now you just define this for all the elementary operations. And the basic idea is that at some fundamental level, everything you do on the computer is made up of very simple operations. And so you can write one piece of code that defines your model. And if you want to know the second uh, or the directional derivative in the direction of U, you then call that model with the value of u and a 1 here. And then the derivative information is propagated through the entire calculation. And it's really slick. <clears throat> so in practice, we only ever write one function for our, uh, for our model, and we use these dual, this dual number approach to evaluate derivatives. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So, so we're using Julia. Uh, there's a very nice dual number package in Julia that we use. We actually forked it, made a couple changes to it. Uh, the, the main change we made is we, we made it possible so that the value itself could be a dual number, so that you can do second derivatives very easily. That for some reason the original code didn't let you do, but we, we fixed that. Uh, but, but yeah, there's, there's libraries for this. And it, it, it works very well for scripting languages where, where you can write one piece of code and then call it with different, op or different object types as arguments. So in our approach, this is the best way we found to do this. And it, and it works really well. The one downside is that Julia being a young language, we're currently refactoring some of our code because there's, there's been a new library that's come out that's very beautiful that we want to use. and so. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about computational differential geometry. Um, we'll, we'll place a little bit more around with it in the tutorial. Uh, but are there any questions before I move on to numerical methods? Okay. Uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? All right. So when I... Uh, first started out as a postdoc. Um, I was talking to somebody in, in my department and I mentioned that I, was, I had studied information geometry and they found that interesting because they were a statistician and they were aware of information geometry, uh, but they were a little confused as to why it existed. Uh, that they weren't aware of any case that information geometry had had any influence on, back on the statistics community. And I think in a lot of cases, for, for various reasons, that's true. Uh, but this is one field where information geometry has actually played um, a somewhat important role. And that's in uh, designing better algorithms for optimization, so for numerical methods. And I've, in my slides, I've created a list of five or six uh, advances that came from information geometry. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip and do a few that I think are uh, the most interesting. So uh, one is 
we call the natural gradient. So the context here is some sort of iterative optimization algorithm. So you're trying to train, uh, so that this is, this is a, I would recommend looking at this paper by Sunichi Amari uh, from almost 20 years ago. Uh, but in, in this context, he was, I think, thinking about uh, training neural networks. Uh, but, but basically, any highly parameterized model you're trying to fit to some, some data or, or some, some curve. And the particular problem they had was that the algorithms were very slow. So this, the convergence was slow. And there was also this other thing called the plateau, plateau problem. Let me explain a little. Well, maybe I have a picture here before I draw, draw it on the blackboard. Okay. So, so cost surfaces often have a very common structure. Uh, and we've seen this in sloppy modeling, that around the best fit, there's a very narrow canyon with a long aspect ratio. That aspect ratio is given by the, uh, the ratio of the square roots of the eigenvalues of the Fisher information. Um, and so it's long and narrow. And then as you go away from the best fit, the, the bowl that kind of curves up slowly flattens out and it plateaus and it becomes very flat. And that's, that's really problematic. If, you're, if your initial guess lives out here on the plateau, you have to find the canyon before you can, in order to do the optimization. And so it's sort of like, imagine you're on a golf course and you're, the, the problem is to find the bottom of the hole, of the cup, uh, but you're only allowed to use local information. Okay. It's, it's kind of challenging. <clears throat> okay. so, so the idea is you want to take an iterative algorithm that takes where you currently are, does some local calculations, so you can calculate derivatives here, and then you want to step somewhere that you think is going to be a better fit. And so one, one thing you might try is uh, a stepping in the, the, gradient, the negative gradient direction. So this is just a steepest descent algorithm. So here, our step dx is going to be negative tau times grad c, and tau is just a parameter that you tune to adjust your step size. So, so if, if you can go a long ways downhill, you want to make tau very big, so you take big steps. And then at some point, you get closer to the, to the bottom, and you're going to take smaller steps. Um, this algorithm is famously bad. And to understand why, let me draw a picture. Let's suppose this is our best fit. Here's our ellipse of our cost contours. But our model's nonlinear, otherwise we could just write down the solution. So our cost contours bend into this banana looking shape. Something like that. Okay. Now, if you start out, Say somewhere over here is uh, your starting point. You're going to go downhill, which will point in this direction. And so you, you might step, and you won't go to the exact bottom of this canyon because you don't know how far that way that is. So you're going to adjust your tau until you find something that gets you lower than where you currently were. And so you might end up, say, here. Now you're going to do the same thing again, and you're going to go here. And as you repeat this, you're just going to kind of zigzag back and forth across the bottom of this canyon, when in fact you want to go that way. So gradient descent is an awful algorithm to use. <clears throat> and so what uh, Amari says is, well, rather than going downhill in parameter space, we should go downhill in data space. Well, what does that mean? This, this gradient here, you, you all know, is the direction of steepest descents, which means this is the direction you go to decrease the cost most per unit change in parameters. Uh, Amari says, we want to go in the direction that, that decreases the cost the most per unit change in model behavior change. And to do that, you stick an inverse metric right here in front of the gradient. You can kind of see how that works. 
you want to take bigger steps in the sloppy directions. So if you invert this metric, those small eigenvalues are now going to become big and you're going to magnify any motion along, along the long axis. Okay? So, so that's what we're going to propose. Uh, for least squares problems, this ends up being equivalent to the Gauss-Newton method. And uh, Amari has this nice result. He shows that this, is, this algorithm is Fisher efficient, well, which is a technical thing we won't have time to discuss. Um, but the implication of that is that this method, in addition to being solving this oscillation problem, can solve the plateau problem. So I now need to tell you what the plateau, well, I guess I did tell you about the plateau, right? That if you go far enough away, it flattens out. I mentioned that, okay. Yeah. So this is for steepest descent, right? Yeah. Conjugate gradient. Ah. Conjugate gradient tries to solve it. It doesn't solve it as efficiently as this. But yeah, that's, this is the motivation behind conjugate gradient as well. Uh, so in order to use this, so, so sometimes you have an optimization problem that doesn't have a special structure, and conjugate gradient is what you would use then. Uh, here, there's this special structure that you, you can calculate this metric because it comes from a probability distribution. Okay. So I skipped over talking about uh, geodesic coordinates last time because we ran out of time, but we'll, we'll bring it up now. Uh, so we have this sort of long ellipsoid, ben, bent ellipsoid banana looking shape. <clears throat> and the, the idea we have is if we were on the model, if we did steepest descents on the model manifold, it's, it's very efficient. And so the, the problem with algorithms in this space is all a consequence of bad parameterization. So can we use geodesics to construct a natural parameterization that's specific to the optimization problem? So here I have a model manifold that's for our two exponentials. So uh, it, it has the, the triangle looking shape. And what we do is we construct geodesics starting at the center right here, which is our best fit. And we just constructed geodesics as straight lines radiating outward. And then we use these geodesics to construct a new coordinate system. So if you think about polar coordinates, uh, which geodesic we're on is determined by an angle, say an angle with respect to this, this line. And then you can choose any point in the parameter space by choosing a geodesic and moving a distance along it. So we took those polar-like coordinates and converted them into their Cartesian analogs, and we looked at the cost contours in that, parameters, in that parameterization, that coordinatization, and this is, this is what we get. So rather than having a cost surface that has a long, narrow canyon and a, and a flat plateau up here, we get something that's nice concentric circles. And the idea is that, you know, if I had this optimization problem, it would be easy. Um, and that's basically what natural gradient is doing. It's saying, I'm going to work in this space rather than this space, and it's going to transform my problem and make it simple. There's a problem, though. So here is our two exponential model. Uh, this is the, the cost surface again. So here's our best fit in the narrow canyon. Um, if you were to calculate the natural gradient at this point, it would point in the direction of this green arrow, which is completely not the direction you want to go, right? <clears throat> so why is that? In fact, this, this picture here shows the field of natural gradients. And sure enough, if you're down here in the canyon, they point in the right direction. But as soon as you get up onto the plateau, which is where Amari is suggesting this, this might be helpful, they actually point in the wrong direction. I'm going to draw a quick picture to illustrate what's going on. You have a model manifold that looks something like this. Let's say the best fit is somewhere over here. And you choose a point that's on the plateau that is living, say, over here. Okay. Now we want to do steepest descents in data space which basically means we're, we want to go in the direction that points from this point to this one. Something like that. And you can see what happens. Before I get to the best fit, I hit a boundary. There's this edge that gets in the way. So what does that mean in terms of parameters? 
well, if I'm going in this direction, I'm getting closer to a boundary. That means I'm pushing my parameters to infinity. Sure enough, that's what the Gauss-Newton direction tells me to do. So in practice, the Gauss-Newton direction actually isn't that good until you get into the canyon. <clears throat> it's very likely to encounter a boundary long before you get to the best fit. Okay, I'm going to skip uh, Monte Carlo. Let's do Lovenberg Marquardt. Okay. So Lovenberg Marquardt uh, is an algorithm that's trying to solve the same problem. We're doing iterative steps towards the best fit. And it was originally derived not in the context of geometry. It was just an algebraic derivation. They said, we want to minimize the cost, but we're only allowed to use local information, so I'm calculating derivatives. So I'm going to approximate the cost by its linearization. Okay, so I've just taken this nonlinear residual function and replaced it with a linear r naught plus j delta theta. Then we're going to minimize this, and if you, if you minimize this, that gives you the natural gradient Gauss-Newton direction of, of the last few slides. Um, but Levenberg and Marquardt say, uh, this should only be valid, this approximation should only be valid as long as I'm close to where I currently am. And so I'm going to add a constraint that I'm going to minimize this subject to the constraint of the step. Sorry, there should be a delta right there, my apologies. But the step is less than some trust region delta. And if you work through the math, what you find is that that proposes a step given by this expression. It looks a lot like the Gauss-Newton direction, except you have this term right here that has a lambda uh, dtd. This lambda is a Lagrange multiplier. It's usually called the damping parameter. And we usually take uh, dtd to be the identity. So effectively, what does that mean? Well, if you think about JTJ as a sloppy Fisher information, it has a lot of small eigenvalues. But if you add lambda times the identity to that, that means the eigenvalues of this matrix, JTJ plus lambda i, will always be at least lambda. And so it allows you to control the condition number of this matrix. Okay, so rather than accelerate a lot along the sloppy directions, by controlling lambda, we can choose how much, how much, we, uh, uh, how much we're, we're accelerated there. Okay. So it's interesting. If you take the limit, the lambda becomes very large. If you look at this expression, lambda becomes big. It dominates here, so we can ignore JTJ. And we find that we just step in the gradient direction. On the other hand, if lambda becomes small, then we can ignore the lambda term, and we just get natural gradient descent. So, so the beauty of the levenberg marquardt algorithm is that it allows you to interpolate between these two regimes. <clears throat> This was all done without any information geometry. And it works amazingly well. But I think information geometry gives some deep insights into why it, why it works. So this term, JTJ plus lambda i, looks a lot like a metric, a sort of modified metric. And in fact, it is a metric. Uh, it's a metric on the model graph. So what do I mean by model graph? We've talked about the model manifold. The model manifold, I have one embedding space dimension for each model prediction. The model graph, I'm going to plot the model outputs versus the model parameters. So now my embedding space is going to be all of the model predictions plus the parameter space. So the embedding space is now m plus n. And what that means is that in our original model manifold, we had these boundaries, and those were the, the curse of natural gradient descent. On the model graph, these boundaries correspond to infinite parameter values. So they've been stretched out infinitely far in the dimensions that include the, the parameter space directions. So the model graph, it looks like this. So there are no boundaries on the model graph. It's an unbounded manifold. And that is the, uh, the surface that Levenberg Marquardt's operating on. And so our, our geometric insight is that the, the success of levenberg marquardt is due to operating on this geometric surface that removes the boundaries that were plaguing the, gradient, or the natural gradient descent. Okay. 
we'll skip that one. So a typical opt optimization problem, you can think of the algorithm as seeing something like this. Uh, these are the, geode the geodesic coordinates. This is the geodesic coordinates for lambda equals zero. So this is the model manifold, and you can see the boundaries here. This is the geodesic coordinates for a very large lambda, so it looks just like parameter space. It's the bent banana shape. And here you can see geodesic coordinates for some values of lambda in between. Okay. <clears throat> so what happens, your initial parameter guess lives out somewhere on the plateau. You're somewhere out here. Lovenberg Markport says, let's start with a very large value of lambda. We're going to go downhill. So we're going to go downhill to here. And now we're going to decrease our lambda. And as we do that, we're effectively going to suck this point closer and closer to the best fit. And now we're going to use natural gradient to zoom in at the end. So we, we start off doing descent on this manifold and then end, end up doing descent on this manifold. Yeah. What are the axes? The axes are different, are, parameter, are uh, parameterizations. So these are geodesic coordinates. So this is an alternate parameterization uh, on the model manifold constructed using geodesics. Okay. The last thing, uh, so Lovenberg mark work works, works really well. Uh, it's it's uh, really effective, but it can be slow. And it becomes slow when this canyon becomes very narrow. Because what happens is it starts off doing gradient descent, it comes into the canyon, and then it has to follow the canyon along. Um, and and if, if it's very narrow and windy, the steps it has to take are very small. <clears throat> but the windingness we've already seen goes away if we were in geodesic coordinates. So the idea is, can we use some geodesic information to speed up levenberg marquardt and so the idea is that we're going to think of optimization as a geodesic flow on the model manifold. So if we, we're now going to extend our step to be delta theta as some velocity plus an acceleration term. And you could imagine adding more terms, but we'll stop at the acceleration. So the first order term is just going to be the regular levenberg marquardt step. And the second order term is going to be the right-hand side of the geodesic equation. Okay. We write that out, and this ends up being this. So the idea is that uh, the lovenberg marquardt would take a step along this direction, but the, the, but the banana curves, and so we're going to add an acceleration that accounts for how that's going to curve, and we should be able to find a parabolic path that better matches the curving banana. Now, a couple comments about this. So, Usually, derivatives are expensive to calculate. <clears throat> and the reason for that is there's lots of them. You have to, if you want to calculate the, your Jacobian, you have to calculate effect, effectively one function, additional function evaluation for every dimension of your parameter space. Okay. So for large models, the bottleneck in optimization is calculating Jacobian. Uh, if you wanted to go a step further and use second derivative information, you would need so if there are n parameters, you would need n squared additional function evaluation. So you would think any second order term is just dead because the computational cost is too much. But we've already mentioned, geodesic acceleration has this funny form. So here's our second derivative. It's contracted twice with the first direction. So we actually don't need the full array of second derivatives. We only need the directional second derivative. And that we can estimate with only one extra function evaluation. So it, strangely, the second order term is practically free. And so our, our strategy then is we're going to test this, this idea on small problems, and we're going to count the number of Jacobian evaluations. And then we know if we try to extrapolate to large problems, the number of Jacobian evaluations will be roughly how, how efficient our algorithm is. So here are a few results. Um, the, there, there are several different, al the performance of several different algorithms are plotted here. So I'll notice we have Jacobian, the number of Jacobian evaluations that range from tens up to several hundred. And we have a problem where we're able to control the condition number of our Fisher information. So we're controlling how narrow this banana is. And you can see that as we make the condition number larger, algorithms slow down. Uh, the two algorithms with dotted lines are algorithms that have incorporated this geodesic acceleration term. Okay. 
And you can clearly see that they're scaling at a different rate with condition number than the others. If we go to another problem that's even more nonlinear, so the, the banana is even more bendy, the, the effect becomes more dramatic. So this works amazingly well. And I'm going to skip this last point so that we can talk about the manifold boundary approximation method. OK. So to this point, there's lots of ideas that have been thrown about. Uh, we've talked about practical identifiability and sloppiness, and there's still this lingering question about how to define it. Uh, we think it has something to do with boundaries of a model manifold. Uh, there's some sort of low effective dimensionality that allows us to have predictions without parameters. Manifold boundaries have shown up quite often. And we just saw that using geodesics to systematically explore the behavior space of a model can lead to very efficient algorithms for optimization. Um, we're going to incorporate most of these ideas together to form a method for constructing simple models with fewer parameters out of complex ones. So first, we're going to ask, what are these boundaries that we've seen over and over again? Well, our simple two-parameter model with two exponentials has three boundaries. And if we look closely at what they are, one of them corresponds to one of the parameters becoming 0. That would be this edge right here. One corresponds to one of the parameters becoming infinite. That's this edge right here. And one corresponds to the two parameters becoming equal. So if you remember, if you think of parameter space, the model mapping takes that parameter space and effectively folds it in half. So we have a boundary where, along the fold line. But in general, we find that the boundaries of the model manifold are always physically interesting limits. So uh, in this case, the three, if you think of this as modeling some, some dynamics, uh, we have slow dynamics, fast dynamics, and dynamics that are not, not well separated. The time scales aren't well, well separated. So these, these are physically interesting simplifications. The idea is if we choose a boundary that's oriented along the long direction of our model manifold, can we find some low dimensional approximation to the more complicated model? Now, there's lots of model reduction schemes. Model reduction has been around for a very long time. Basically, as long as we've been doing mathematical modeling, we've been doing model simplification. Uh, and so some, some common approaches are things like mean field theory, there's RG, uh, they're seeing the perturbation. If you get into the dynamical systems and control literature, uh, there's uh, lots and lots of methods there. Um, but all of the existing methods are sort of fall short for a few reasons. First, uh, they're limited to specific functional forms. Uh, if you want to use uh, um, a singular perturbation, for example, you need to have some ODE that has a, a singular limit. Um, quite often, this is especially true of models from the control community, that you, they, they give you approximations that are black boxes. So they're, and, and that's okay because that's, that's what they're, they're searching for. They would like something that's uh, efficient to calculate. And so they, they have schemes that will construct numerically efficient approximations. Uh, but if you try to make sense of how that approximation is connected to the, say, the mechanistic details of your original model, it's hopeless. And in a lot of cases, you need to know a priori which parameters are small. So if you're going to do singular perturbation, you need to know that this time scale really is small compared to the others. Uh, and so uh, there really weren't any good solutions for doing model reduction in sloppy models. Uh, we, we tried a lot of them, and they just didn't seem to work. Uh, a few of the problems that we, we now sort of understand why they didn't work is that we needed to find nonlinear combinations of parameters. So, so the practically unidentifiable combinations are, are nonlinear combinations. Often they are. And then even if you could find some nonlinear combination, you need to figure out how to remove it from the model. So a common approach is to just fit a few parameters to some other experiments and then uh, fix those parameters to certain values. And, uh, and that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but we should recognize that if you do that, you're not really simplifying your model. It's, it's still the same functional form. <clears throat> so, so for example, you haven't reduced the number of dynamical variables in your system. So, so MBAM. What we do is we, uh, we start from some initial parameter value. We choose an initial direction in parameter space. 
And what we choose is the eigenvector of the Fisher information that has smallest eigenvalue. And that's ambiguous, right? There's sort of a forward and a backward direction we could choose. Uh, we choose the direction uh, so that if we follow a geodesic in that direction, the parameter space velocity will get bigger. And we notice that when we do this, the initial direction is usually a combination of all of the bare parameters. So, so the sloppiest directions involve comp, uh, all the different parameter effects compensating for one another. So we, we, we move in some direction where we make this parameter bigger and this one smaller and, the, and et cetera for 50 other parameters. And, and the effects all sort of cancel out. Okay. We then solve the geodesic equation numerically. And as we're solving the geodesic equation, we monitor the behavior of the parameters. And, and we're looking for some sort of limiting approximation. Uh, in order to find that limiting approximation, we sort of we have to have some human insight to, to, to watch it and say, ah, oh, this is becoming a singular perturbation limit or something like that. And then once we've found that, we evaluate the limit to remove one parameter combination, and then we take that new, that gives us a new functional form for our model, and then we fit that model to our original model behavior. Yeah, so. Direction. Yeah, so, so this step here when we evaluate the limit, that's effectually uh, replacing our model with the boundary or a portion of the boundary. Okay. So <clears throat> our initial parameter space direction involves a complicated combination of parameters, so uh, something like this. So here's parameter index. This is the, the heights of these bars are just showing the, uh, the value of that component in the, the smallest eigen direction. Uh, we follow the geodesic initially oriented along this direction, and it sort of winds its way through parameter space. And as it curves, uh, it eventually rotates into something that's a very, very simple approximation, something like this. So in this case, the, uh, we have two parameters that are going to infinity together simultaneously. And, and what happens in the model is the ratio becomes a finite parameter that becomes a new uh, parameter in our model. And at the same time, when this rotation happens, the smallest eigenvalue in our model sort of falls off and becomes very close to zero. So when, when the smallest eigenvalue is well separated from the others, that's our key that um, we should be able to recognize the limit from uh, our geodesic. Okay. And then that'll allow us to find the actual boundary of our model. So as an example, uh, this is a, a model for an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So the idea is you have an enzyme and a substrate. They will combine to form some intermediate complex, and they, that process happens reversibly. But they can also break apart uh, to, uh, to free the enzyme and some, say, phosphorylated, or so, some, change, this, some change to the substrate. Okay. So there's a model that you can write down that gives you uh, four differential equations, one for each of the, the chemical species. Uh, and here they are, and you can sort of see what's going on. So this, this term here corresponds to the rate at which the forward reaction is happening. So the rate at which it happens is proportional to the amount of enzyme and proportional to the amount of substrate and some parameter Kf. And then there's a reverse reaction, and it's proportional to some uh, rate uh, constant and the, the amount of intermediate complex. And then this reaction has some parameter and it's also proportional to the amount of complex. So from this, you can construct these four differential equations. There's three parameters. So it has a three-dimensional model manifold. Oops, wrong direction. So what we're going to measure is the output of the final product as a function of time. So here I have product fraction versus time. And all of these bazillion curves correspond to different curves I could get for different choices of my, two param or my, sorry, my three parameters. I've constructed a model manifold uh, that corresponds to observing this product at 5, 10, and 15 time units later. So those are my three axes down here. And you can see what the model manifold looks like. So there, it's a, actually a volume, right, because there's three parameters. But it's very narrow, right? There's clearly a long aspect ratio here. And it's bounded by two, two boundaries that are the, the red and the green faces here. So our goal is going to be to find an analytic expression for one of those two faces and use that as an approximate model to the whole manifold. Okay. 
And you can see from this that that wouldn't be such a bad approximation because it's very thin along the direction that we're, we're leaving out. So we calculated geodesic. Here is a geodesic time. So this is our parameterization of the geodesic curve. And the three curves here correspond to the, comp uh, the values of the parameters at, at those geodesic times. And you can see as it moves along, at some point, just between 0.35 and 0.4, uh, two parameters become infinite. So there's a singularity in our geodesic equation. The singularity corresponds to the geodesic hitting the boundary. So if we want to find the boundary, we need to evaluate the limit that's the, that the geodesic is telling us about. And in this case, it's the parameters kf and kr becoming infinite. So now we need to go back to our equations and try to figure out what that means in terms of, of our model. Okay. So we're going to focus on the equation for S, <clears throat> um, which looks like this. It has the KF and the KR. That's sort of a hint that that's the good place to start. We divide the entire equation by KR. And now we're going to take the limit that these two parameters become infinite. So over here we have something divided by KR that's going to go to zero. Here we have kf over kr. Uh, those are both going to in infinity. And you might guess that they're going to infinity at the same rate. They don't have to, but in this case it turns out they do. Uh, so this is 1 over the disassociation constant of this reaction. Now, uh, if, if you're skeptical that this isn't actually what's going on in the model, you can calculate kf and kr as a function of geodesic time and watch what happens to that ratio as you approach the boundary. And if you were to do that, sure enough, this remains finite. Okay, so this is the finite combination uh, that is the identifiable parameter at the boundary. And so this is our new uh, equation. And so uh, this limit reduces the dynamical order of the system. S is no longer a dynamical variable. Well, something is no longer a dynamical variable. There's an algebraic relationship between C, E, and S that's related by this new parameter, KD. This was the equation we derived on the last slide. Uh, it turns out that if you look at the equations, there's a conservation law built into them. So the total amount of enzyme in your system is unchanged. So the total amount of enzyme is the free enzyme plus whatever enzyme is sitting inside of the complex. So uh, this is a consequence of the equations. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace E here with KDC over S. I've just solved this equation for E and put it in. Uh, and now I'm going to solve this equation for C. And I get this expression. And now, if I look at the equation for P, which is the thing I'm trying to predict, uh, its production rate is Kc times the amount of complex. So I can finally complete the expression and write dp dt Kc times C, this expression. And if you've done any biochemistry, you'll recognize this is the famous michaels menten equation. We've reproduced a result that's 100 years old. Now, a couple comments here. Um, the way Mc this is different from how Michaelis and Menten derived it. They didn't use differential geometry. They had a deep insight that the substrate should be in equilibrium. If the substrate is in equilibrium, ds dt equals 0. And that equation implies this relationship, which is the first relationship we derived when we calculated our limit. Now, mathematicians will then take this result and say, well, under what conditions of my parameters is that valid? And they will go ahead and tell you, well, that's only valid if KF and KR are both much faster than KC. Okay. Ah, but that's exactly the limit that we found, right? <clears throat> so the derivation that Michaelis and Menten, even though it was motivated in a different way, is completely equivalent to, to what we're doing. Okay. It's, it's worth noting that if this equilibrium approximation is valid, then KF and KR become structurally unidentifiable, and KD is the identifiable combination. What's, what's different here and what's really interesting is that Michaelis and Menten had thought about this problem for a long time, and they had a very deep insight into how the system was working that allowed them to come up with this, this simple approximation. Okay. We haven't applied any sort of insight at all. All we've done is write down the equations and let the statistics tell us what's important. Okay. So, so whereas Michaelis and Menten brought their deep physical insight into the system behavior, MBAM gives us a way to extract physical insight from the behavior of perhaps complicated models where it's, the insight isn't so easy to find. 
How are we doing on time? 15 minutes? Okay. So on Thursday, I'm going to talk about modeling adaptation. And there's a particular model of adaptation that involves a network of uh, negative, uh, negative feedback loop. And if you write down the equations for it, this, this is what you get. So what I want to do is work out the first three MBAM limits that you get when you try to simplify these equations. Okay. So the first one, uh, so first of all, let me point out there's 12 parameters here. And I realize you're seeing this for the first time. And so it, that looks like just a big blob of symbols on the, the board. But hopefully they'll start to make sense a little bit as we go through them. The first equation, or the first limit, is little kfa times big kfa going to infinity. If we go search through the equations, we see that those happen right here. So there's a little kfa and a big kfa. Let's write down that term. Get that right? OK. Good. So we're, we're going to look at the limit that this term and this term become infinite. The easiest way to do that is to factor this term out of the denominator. So we can write KFA over KFA. Right. So now as we take the limit, these two terms are both going to infinity. And it turns out they're going to infinity at the same rate. So this becomes something finite. This term goes to 0. And so we end up with this expression. This point we started you may recognize is, the Mikhail, is an example of the michaelis metten equation that we derived a second ago. Right. This is our Kc and our disassociation constant from before. <clears throat> this, uh, this particular form is well known to have two regimes. So if you plot uh, ve reaction velocity versus A, at small a, it goes to 0 and then grows linearly. But as a becomes very large, it saturates and flattens off. And the point at which it saturates is roughly given by the michaels metten constant. <clears throat> so this approximation has effectively moved this transition off to infinity. So we've made the approximation that this reaction is always in the linear regime and never in the, the saturated regime. And this is exactly analogous to the sort of insight that Michaelis and Metten had when they were thinking about their equations and they said, this, this substrate is always in equilibrium, or approximately so. Uh, here we turned it around and said, for this particular model that I'll tell you more about on Thursday, we can, make, we can apply the approximation that this reaction is always in the, the linear regime. Because if it weren't, we would be able to identify uh, both of those parameters. Okay. The second limit, KCB and capital KCB, if we search they sit right there, and it's exactly the same sort of approximation. So this, the second approximation is that this reaction is always in the linear regime as well. Okay. So what I want to do now is I'm going to write down on the board the equations for, uh, for B after making these approximations. So our model 
has now become, we're going to have C CB. One minus B. So the third limit that we found was a little more complicated. It involved four parameters. First, KCB over KCB, capital KCB, becomes zero. This one right here. KFB became zero. Capital KFB became zero. And KBC became infinite, so KBC it appears here in the C equation. So your challenge is to write down the reduced model that corresponds to the boundary of that limit. And you have eight minutes. What's that? So, um, so we work through a number one, right? Number two is the same thing as number one. It's just applied to this reaction instead of this reaction. Okay, yeah. so that's that's what I've done here. Okay, so so you can assume number two is already satisfied because I've I've evaluated. I've I've done that part for you. It may be helpful to know that for solving these equations. Uh, we use the initial conditions that B in is initially zero. B is not observed. C is the only thing observed here. So as a hint, before we move on, there's a couple points I want to make before the end. We'll pick this up for the tutorial, as the first thing in the tutorial, though. Is, uh, <clears throat> so as a hint, try Re, uh, rewriting your equations in terms of a B tilde, that's KBC times B. Okay. So we have a method for identifying approximations in our model. And sometimes those approximations are somewhat non-trivial, like this one. But usually if we think about it hard enough, and we usually have more than eight minutes, so I probably wouldn't have gotten this in eight minutes the first time either. Uh, we, we eventually figure them out. And they're always something, at least in our experience, they're always something that's writable downable. So we never end up with a limit that gives us something we just can't evaluate. So for some reason, it's, it's always something nice. Um, so let's come back to this, this original sloppy model that we talked about last time. We had 48 parameters, 29 differential equations, 68 data points. This was the network. Uh, we applied our MBAM to it. And we ended up with this, 12 parameters, six differential equations, equivalent fit to the data. Here are the Fisher information eigenvalues for the before and after. Uh, so initially it's sloppy, very ill-conditioned, and the MBAM process effectively just erases the smallest eigenvalues from, from the model. And you end, end up with something, uh, a phenomenological model that exactly matches the data that you're trying to fit. So we end up with this very simplified network in the process with fewer variables. So this has 12 parameters. Um, I've, I've written phi 9 here because I'm going to show you in a second. But this phi 9 corresponds to the effective edge between these two nodes. Um, there, there's one reason, which is if you go further, the fit to the available data becomes bad. So, so uh, you, can, you can tell, that's the point at which statistically you know that your model is wrong. Okay. Now, um, I will go further on Thursday and show you what happens if you go further. Okay. Um, oops, so, so phenine, 
corresponds to the link between C3G and ERC. Originally, that edge was made up of actually four composite edges. And so somehow we've compressed this sequence of interactions into, to, into one parameter. And because we did it through a sequence of limiting approximations, we actually have an expression for phi9 in terms of those original parameters. And here it is. It's a complicated. Not complicated, I've seen worse. But it's, uh, it's interesting, right? It tells you all of those parameters could be potential control knobs for the phenomenology of your system. And it tells you exactly in what way these parameters are control knobs for that phenomenology. So we interpret this parameter as some sort of, oops, there's a typo, some effective rate of information flow through the channel. And it's, it's an emergent control knob. So even though we have a reduced model, it's not a black box model. It's still connected to the microscopic details. And so that even though we never actually learn the values of all of these microscopic parameters, we still know what the effect of changes to those values would be uh, on the behavior of the system. Now the interpretation of this requires a little bit, a little bit of explanation. Originally, the dynamical variables of our system were all proteins. Uh, we now think of these dynamical variables of the reduced model as sort of functional biological modules. And uh, so whereas we started off with a model of proteins that were interacting chemically, we've now got a model of biological signaling, right? If we come back, oops, to this network, we know that C3G does not interact with ERC. This is a biological relationship, not a chemical relationship. It's a, it's a biological relationship that's mediated through chemical relationships. And we know the details of that mediation, but the model itself is not a chemistry model anymore. Okay. Oh, we were going to do the Ising model. I'm out of time. So we will stop there. And we'll talk about the Ising model on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. So let me bring that up. This one. So those, so these names were the names of parameters in the original model. Yeah. So uh, you have an example where you're recounting parameters. Um, what, what? I'm sorry, I didn't. I mean, like the, this renumeration looks very simple. So it's a bunch of products, ratio of bunch of products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this, the particular form you get is a consequence of the form of the, the original model. So uh, the original model was differential equations that were sums of terms. And so the ratios come about because of you're having, you're having, you're having sums of terms. Um, uh, as something more complicated, uh, in Hodgkin-Huxley model, for example, uh, you have exponentials. And so you have uh, coarse-grained parameters that are parameter one times the exponential of a parameter two. Uh, yeah, but, but there, uh, that functional form emerges at the it inherits the functional form of the original Hodgkin-Huxley model. No, yeah. Well, it's not MBAM, it's you. You have to, you have to decipher it. But, yeah. <laughs>